It'd be a bit of a vignette about vignettes, right? A vignette about vignettes. Sounds about right. This thing on. I hope so. Is it glowing? Is the thing. Uh, uh, uh. Hold on. I think it goes straight to the Is that glowing? No, it's not glowing. Hold on. I will. I was right. It wasn't on. <laughs> it's my. I think the battery might be flat. Yeah, it's not turning on. Sorry, you online people. <laughs> Hold on. Do I just pull this out? Because uh, I don't want to break it. Yeah, I did. I was worried that I might break it. Okay. okay. That should be good. Mm -hmm. um, Can you check that uh, it's. Say something. Something. Keep saying something. Something, 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 <laughs> something. Cool. Okay. okay. Something. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So um, I guess I should actually introduce myself, which because I didn't put a nice slide in about who I was at the beginning of this, which would have been very smart of me. Um, but my name is Ayanna Willard. Um, I'm a psychologist, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, I do a cultural evolution of religion predominantly, uh, and as well as dabble in some other things. Um, so I'm going to talk about vignettes because I use them a lot. Uh, so I'm assuming this is why John decided this was my topic. Um, this is this is not the most sort of, there's not a lot to vignettes, <laughs> so I'm not <laughs> entirely sure how I'm going to fill an hour with this, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. Um, I do think this is, this is an interesting methodology, um, but if, you know, if we run, if I, if I run out of things to say, you can ask me about cultural evolution, which is a much more interesting <laughs> set of <laughs> methods and theories. Okay, um, <clears throat> so a vignette is basically just a very short story that we use in research. Um, they often describe a person or a situation, and you, uh, they're used both in qualitative and quantitative research, and the idea here is, is that you elicit some sort of reaction measured either in Likert scales or behavior, um, depending on how, what your outcome variable is, but the idea is, is you give someone a situation and then you measure how they react um, in some way. So this is an example of a vignette. This is from a study that John and I designed and never ran. So if anyone wants, wants these, we've got a bunch of them. Um, so uh, Cho Yao works in a government ministry. He's in charge of hiring a new senior, ma senior manager because he speaks the Hokan dialect. He decided to hire someone who from the same dialect clan as him over several qualified candidates from a different dialect clan. So, so this is just a very basic situation, um, and the idea here was to look at um, kind of cooperation and corruption and how this sort of differs across uh, cultures and religious groups. Um, so to, to stick this with the sort of stuff that John was talking about earlier, what we're doing here is we're presenting people with this sort of situation, some, some sort of context uh, that they're, that they're, we're trying to get a reaction of reaction from, we're measuring that reaction, and then we're inferring what their belief is. So if in the example I just gave, um, we, would, we would, if someone said, yes, it's fine, you should do this, it's totally fine, we can assume something about how they think about hierarchy and the, the benefits of, of uh, hiring someone from your group versus sort of the more egalitarian stuff. Um, and we, you know, the, the idea is that this might differ based on religious or cultural background. Okay. So why do we do this stuff? Um, so it, it, essentially, I mean, I use this as a way to present information that's a bit more relatable to people doing studies. So um, as, as a, someone who was vaguely trained as a psychologist, I've used a lot of scales. Um, my entire PhD dissertation was based on scale measures. At some point towards the end of my PhD, I did a proper statistical course on measurement theory and then decided that maybe I would never use a scale again. <laughs> and I think that there is, you know, there is some valid validity in, in, in how we measure in this way with, with these scales, but you know, there's a lot of really unspoken assumptions 
there. And so this, to me, is just a way to present people with a little bit more what we call face valid <laughs> content rather than, than looking across sets of scales. Um, so they're more realistic and less abstract than survey questions. We can kind of get it at something a little bit more realistic. And we're kind of starting from a different, so we're not, we're not necessarily measuring belief. We're, we're sort of inferring belief in a different way. Um, I also think that these sort of things can elicit more uh, authentic reactions to abstract questions. So in the case of, you know, if, if you go back to John's talk and the idea that like beliefs don't often, don't often relate to actual behaviors or they're inconsistent. I mean, for the sort of stuff that I'm doing and the theories that I'm working with, I honestly don't really care what people would say they believe if asked a question. I really want to know how it affects their behavior. So in that sense, I think we get um, a little bit more, uh, hopefully a little bit better reaction. Um, yeah. So people can say that nepotism is bad. In the example I just gave, if you say, OK, we wouldn't do this. But presented with a situation in a certain cultural context, they said, no, obviously, you would hire your son here over a more qualified person. If you don't do that, you're a terrible parent. Right? So, so those are the sorts of things that uh, I'm looking for. And, and there's, this is a not uncommon thing. Right? Yeah. OK. Uh, and the other thing with this is that you kind of get these somewhat more so it, it's, it's a way you can kind of run stuff. You can do these things online, much like a survey. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's a, it, can, it can lead to much larger samples if you want to do it that way. Um, ah, yeah, so one of the benefits is that they're a little bit easier than surveys to use across cultures. There's like a bit of work that goes into doing this, um, and you need to kind of validate things or at least talk to people who are familiar with those cultural contexts to make sure your stories work. But this is a lot easier than trying to take something like a supernatural belief scale and make it work across a lot of societies, right? Like you don't, the, the process here is a little bit more straightforward and it's a little bit easier. You can design very basic stories that can work across larger numbers of groups much more easily. Um, yeah. It's also much easier to run this stuff because if you've done a lot of cross-cultural research, you will discover that a lot of places, surveys are just not, people don't like doing this. They don't understand what you're doing. They find it really, I mean, the most kind of extreme reaction I think we got was actually running something here with the Roma population where we would ask them sets of questions in a survey, which are often quite similar, and they would just not answer them. They're like, you just asked me a question that was almost exactly the same as this one. I'm done. I'm not doing this, which like in retrospect is, is like, why isn't everyone doing that? <laughs> like, I don't understand. So, so I think people, like in a lot of contexts, people find these sort of short stories much more familiar and a little bit easier and, and less of a strange situation, um, particularly when we start doing cross-cultural research. Um, so it also allows us to look at sort of the types of situations in a multifaceted way. So with, with vignettes, you can vary a bunch of different things systematically. Uh, so you can look at how things interact. Um, so a lot of the stuff when we talk about religion research or the supernatural beliefs kind of wow. talk earlier today, we talk about like how we're measuring, you know, little bits of this stuff and trying to put it all together. So vignettes do kind of allow you in, in a minimal sense <laughs> to put some of these ideas back together. You can look at how different aspects interact and I'll give some examples in a second. Um, so you can look at things like, so something that we've done is look at like a type of ritual and a motivation for doing a ritual and how these things predict outcomes, right? So then you can, you can get a series of vignettes that include both of these variables and then you can look at how they interact in a, in a way that is not possible with survey data. Okay. Um, so this, this related to this, they're quite flexible and can be iterated, so you can look at these things across multiple domains. Um, you can systematically change information in a, in a, as a manipulation. So when we write a vignette, we can make it very like a baseline vignette where we're just changing one or two things, and this is sort of an experimental design. So we end up with something that is much more controlled, where we can actually vary information presented to people in a way that is experimental. Um, we do this to varying degrees of, well, I think in my own research, I can, I can tell you there's some caveats here. And sometimes this is much easier and much uh, more controlled than others. Um, yeah. So an example of this is uh, manipulating levels of group favoritism and to see, uh, to look at group differences in cooperation and corruption. So the, the example I just gave. So um, the idea, the kind of supernatural belief side of that is looking at whether or not ancestor worship um, and the sort of this idea that you have long-standing 
um, ancestor clans would lead people to think that they should favor members of their family more strongly. Um, we have some initial evidence that suggests that, and then we just never follow it up. <laughs> so, someday, maybe. <laughs> Okay, um, so here, here's some examples. So this is again from a study that we didn't run. I just thought, you know, maybe someone wants to do this. Uh, Dan Poe runs a mid-sized investment firm. He has, open, um, he has an opening for a new vice president. There is a particularly qualified person already within the company, but his son also needs a job. And so then the two kind of iterations of this vignette would be Dan Poe decides to appoint a more qualified person to the position over his son, or he decides to appoint his son over a more qualified person. Right, so different people would see different versions of this vignette. And and then we can see how, how they react. And there is a lot of cultural context in which not appointing your child to a position when they need a job would be considered morally wrong, right? And so this is the sort of thing that we're, we're trying to elicit here. So, um, you know, it, it fits with a kind of an ideal of uh, our theory of different levels of cooperation. We kind of think that like cooperation is this anonymous thing where you treat everyone equally, but actually other forms of cooperation are things like helping make, make sure your family is, is always supported. Um, yeah, so uh, a similar thing, uh, Peng Shu is an inspector for a government health and safety committee. He inspects restaurant. He's also a devout Buddhist. He recently inspected a restaurant that had some health and safety violations. But because the owner was also a devout Buddhist and decided not, uh, and he decided not to report them if the owner promised to fix the errors, um, would be one side and the other one would be, even though the owner was a devout Buddhist uh, and promised to fix the errors, he decided to report them. So we're looking at a variation in whether or not you're violating different group biases. Okay. Um, so for this, the, the outcome questions that we never ran would have been how right or wrong is this? Um, if you, so looking at just general, and to like general kind of rating of how right and wrong, and these are all Likert scale responses. Um, and if you were in Peng Shu's position, uh, how likely would you be to make the same choice? So asking people about your own behavior and the one that we're actually particularly interested in here is how likely are most people in your community to think that Peng Shi made the right choice. So we're looking at differences. We want to look at differences in norms. And our previous study that we did, um, we just ran, we, we, it was sort of a, a version of a dictator game where we, we asked people to divide up money between, uh, hypothetical money, <laughs> between different groups. Um, and we found that like there was some, some level of in-group favoritism, family favoritism amongst the ancestor worshipers above other groups of Buddhists. Okay. Um, so there's one of the things that you have to think about when you're sort of designing these protocols is how you're going to, if you want to do something that is an experimental control, how you're going to do that. So the first option here is to use the exact same vignette and only change the variables you're measuring. This is sort of the best way. <laughs> so it's a better experimental design. It has kind of more, um, you can really look at whether or not just changing this variable is the thing that makes a difference here. Uh, the con is that it must be between subjects. Mm -hmm. So if you have nine conditions, you need a huge number of people, so they can, you know, upwards of 500 people to run a study like that. And yeah, so the option two is to vary the story somewhat as well as the variables you're interested in. So the pro to this is that your participants can be read more than one, one vignette, so we can look at, uh, we can sort of, give a set of stories that are slightly different so that it's not clear that they're just reading the same thing with a subtle iteration. Um, obviously, the con here is that if there's an impact um, of the thing you varied, sometimes, sometimes you can't really tell whether it's the result you're looking for or some other uh, thing happening here. So um, an example of this, which actually I might have put in the slides <laughs> later, but we, we did this with a, a set of cross-cultural variables with the Hadza. Um, and we kind of had to cut down the level of vignettes that we ran, and so one of them, we're looking at whether or not supernatural beliefs, people think misfortune happened for supernatural beliefs, and one of them was someone losing their voice, and it turns out that the Hadza, unbeknownst to the experimenters who <laughs> helped design this, who are familiar with them, they really think that that's frequently caused by witchcraft. All right, so then we have a much higher rate in that one condition. Luckily, we had enough of other variations that it didn't, totally like mess up our study, but like we just didn't know that. So we, it, if we, because we didn't systematically, we gave different outcomes, different types of illness outcomes for each thing. Um, this one thing kind of skewed the results in 
the opposite direction of what we were expecting, but you know, a little bit of follow-up information was like, oh, right, sorry, we, we made a, a small boo-boo there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so the option three, and this is usually what I end up doing, is doing both things. So you make a variety of vignettes, but systematically uh, vary the most important uh, aspects. So if you have four conditions, you end up with four vignettes that are all different, different types of stories, and then there's four versions of each of those vignettes. So you can give people four vignettes, and that means that every single person sees every condition, but then you have full iterations across. So um, for stuff that I'll show you in a moment with Fiji and Singapore, looking at intentionality, we for each of these things we had uh, four vignettes with uh, intentionality conditions. So like there's four different stories about four different people and then each of those followed each in, uh, intentionality condition. So each person sees four different vignettes and then there's four different sets that go across the whole sample and that allows us to do a much more um, smaller sample essentially because we're, we're getting each person across each, each condition while also kind of controlling for the variation. These, these this sort of setup gets really complicated really quickly <laughs> when you start kind of looking across more, more and more variables. Okay, so one of the things that we've learned, I've learned, is that, that making these as short as possible is really important, using very simple language. Um, even if you're not doing cross-cultural research, particularly if you're doing them online, people get really bored of reading your stories really quickly, and if they're more than a couple sentences long, people just tune out and you lose you lose any of the effect. So, you know, this is this is a nice short one um, that we used in a study on karma. Aang was at a market uh, where there were lots of people there. There was an old woman who couldn't afford food. Aang noticed that the old woman brought some produce and uh, noticed the old woman and brought some produce for the for her the woman's dinner, as opposed to um, this is the other one is sort of wanting to do it but not actually succeeding. So a nice short couple sentences, very easy, people can read this. Um, this is another one I've used that we used in this large cross-cultural study that has really very cool results and I will never do this again. <laughs> so, uh, so it's quite a long um, vignette and what we're, we're varying three different things. So, th so the Hadza example is from this. So we have, we describe a community that's like their community but not their community, and then we describe a norm. So it's expected that wealthy people help poor people in this community, um, and that most people do this thing, so we're establishing a norm. We establish a person, and then we say whether or not that person does the normative thing or not. So either they, they help or don't help, um, and then something bad happens to them, which is either an illness or a loss of resources. So in this case, it's a loss of resources. So this is really long, it's complicated. Um, the iterations across this, there was a lot of them. It was, it was a pain in the ass and everyone who did this project, which was a lot of people hated it and it's just been, it's been a whole thing. So, so I would recommend making things simpler than this and maybe <laughs> trying smaller sets of variations. Okay, so um, I'm, I thought I would give some examples of stuff we've done with vignettes just to give I don't know, some indication of how this actually works. So this is a set of things we did in Fiji. So this is something I did with Rita McNamara. She was the lead on this. Um, and so in, in Fiji, it's a, a place that has um, opacity of mind norms. So it's rude to think about other people's mental states. So you're not supposed to think about internal mental states. And so we wanted to know if Fiji, Fijians consider the internal mental states of others when thinking about punishment. And the answer is, like most research of this type is that no, but it's really complicated. So um, can you see me? So the interesting variables here are this one. So this is, this is the Asawans, these are the Fijians, this is a group of Indians, Indian origin people living in Fiji, and this is North Americans. And so what we're interested in here is, is this, um, accidental. So Fijians see that accidental harm is just is quite punishworthy, right? So they're much more punishworthy than Indo-Fijians or North Americans. But they also see people who want to harm someone but fail as punishworthy, which suggests that they are actually considering, even though they're not, Talking about this, there is some sense in which they do understand that mental states have an impact. Um, so, so this is this is kind of a nice finding that you get you get these kind of yes but <laughs> answer. So it's not that they can't think about mental states. It's not that they can completely get rid of thinking about mental states, but it does have an impact on how they think about the world and how they behave. This this taboo. Um, I really like this study. It was a lot of fun to read, fun to run, and. Uh, 
yeah. So, so this is just kind of the types of things you can look at. So we did um, something very similar. This is uh, the first study that we never followed up on. Uh, so we were looking at karma believers. So we did this and then we did a second study that I won't talk about on ancestor worship. And the, the point of this paper uh, was largely that we wanted to kind of look at whether or not small differences maybe not small, but differences in how people believed things, whether or not they could have an effect on these sort of reward and punishment. So when we talk about supernatural belief, we kind of make, the, there's a lot of this, and I am very guilty of this, broad claims about like supernatural punishment leads to X behavior, um, and there's not a lot of sense of nuance, but there, there is a lot of nuance in what people believe. So we kind of, we looked at a bunch of small things. So we were interested in whether karma believers because of how they think about reward and punishment. So karma is about a system of merit and demerit. So if you've done a lot of bad things, doing good things can help, right? Where in, in sort of big God religions, that's less clearly the case. Um, and we also wanted to see if the kind of focus in Buddhism specifically on intent made a difference. And so the answer is yes, these things are important and they do change, but the effects are pretty small. So it's not, um, it is the case that Buddhists cared more about reward than our other groups, our karma believers, and they definitely cared more about intention, both in good and bad behavior, but like the effects are quite small. They're not, these are not huge differences. Um, they get a little bit bigger if we look at just people who believe in karma versus people who don't. So this is actually our non-Buddhist samples, and we see a, nice, a much more clean effect here. So amongst Christians and, uh, and the non-religious, um, we see a much larger effect of karma belief, but so it does suggest that the, the kind of the content of these beliefs matter. It's not just about punishment; it's about how people are thinking about punishment. Um, and then we did some follow-up stuff with ancestor worship um, and, and Buddhist beliefs as well. So. John and I should not be allowed to design studies. We make very complicated <laughs> designs. Uh, so these, these are simplified versions of the plots that ended up in the actual paper. Um, so yeah. Um, so this is that really long vignette I showed you uh, where we were looking at essentially whether or not people who, um, whether or not people across cultural think that clearly unrelated, so natural disaster type things, things that can't be obviously related to a bad behavior, whether or not people think that those are supernaturally caused when they know that the person has done bad behavior in the past. Um, and so this is, so th these results here are, are from this. Again, this is sort of a simplified version of the, the, um, the kind of bigger design. But what, so I took out the normative versus non-normative because it makes the plot really, hard to see and I just stole these from other presentations, <laughs> didn't make a new one, so, so there, there's a second plot that I'm supposed to show you and won't that has the non-normative stuff. Um, but basically we do find that this is pretty consistent. So what this is, um, so we did find some evidence on both scale questions and free list questions and this is from the free list questions. Um, and this is sort of a really difficult but quite <coughs> rewarding way to get information. Um, looking at these free look questions. Oh, I thought they had a thing on. Hmm. Okay, somewhere in this there is a, a side on free list that got moved. <laughs> so um, I, I, I'll talk a bit at some point in this. I thought it was right after this on about free lists and why that's a really rewarding way to get data. So essentially, we just ask people open endedly to say what caused these supernatural. Um, or what caused this, this thing to happen, and we just code their answers um, for content, and that's how we get this plot here. So although a lot of places you have really low percentage, they, they literally can say anything they want, and we're still getting across all of these groups some level, um, some percentage of, of um, supernatural answers. The only place where we get more supernatural, consistently more supernatural answers than natural answers is Papua New Guinea. So most people will say, natural things, <laughs> they'll give you, or they'll give you sort of, you know, they upset this neighbor and, and he caused the flood, or he, he did this thing, or he poisoned all of his cattle, or whatever caused the illness. Um, so that's our most common answer, but we do see for when, when they know people have done something bad in the past, they're more likely to give supernatural causes. Okay, um, one of the other things that we, we did, which was looking at, so this is looking at types of rituals. We gave people a set of rituals, and we wanted to know whether or not people were, 
uh, thought that someone who did something that was clearly a witchcraft ritual compared to a religious ritual or something that was a non-ritual, whether they were seen as less trustworthy of causing more harm to the community, and whether or not this changed with motivation, if the motivation was envy or selfishness. Right? So there's some theories about origins of witchcraft being, being related to envy. Um, and so this, so what we found here is, uh, essentially, the motivation didn't matter because everyone thinks witchcraft is terrible, which I think, again, in retrospect, we should have anticipated. But what we did find was, was un, um, unanticipated is because we also collected for this free list answers, when we gave people these, these motivations, people just accused people of witchcraft. So, you know, we told them, like, this is a religious ritual. They're going to the temple, and they're like, are they, though? I think maybe they're doing witchcraft. <laughs> so, so when we give these motivations, so we didn't, we didn't find the, the anticipated result for the witchcraft stuff, but we did find something that, that kind of fits with what our overall hypothesis was because we collected some qualitative data along with the quantitative data. So people were much more likely in both the witchcraft and the, or the, the religious and the neutral condition to say that someone accused someone of witchcraft. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so when we talk about validity, I'm going to focus on ecological validity. So what are, uh, I think there's, it's really hard to know whether or not we're getting at something that is relevant to the real world situation. So if, if we weren't giving people hypothetical situations, would they behave? <sighs> I don't know how we judge this that well. Um, so I think that the face validity is better than a lot of questionnaire surveys, so we're, we're actually just straight up asking people situations that are familiar to them. So in that sense, I think maybe uh, it's a little bit more ecologically valid, uh, but it's, it's hard to judge. Um, I think when we do a lot of these things, and increasingly now, as, as I kind of progress in my career, we always, include sort of open-ended free list data questions. So we always just ask people sort of, what do you think is happening here? What would you do? <laughs> like, what is the cause of this? And I think that's really helpful in, in sort of judging whether or not we're getting at what we want. So if people are without, you know, without kind of, without a structuring a set of questions, um, if they're also kind of giving similar answers, that helps with some of this in judging these things. But you can't do the sort of statistical analyses that uh, John was talking about to look at reliability and validity across these things. So you have to kind of think about other things. Um, yeah. So um, the other side of this is that if you actually wanted to look at say, different levels of cooperation and acceptance of nepotism in the real world, like this is just not something you can observe systematically without, I just don't know how you would go about doing these sorts of things. So to get the type of data through other sort of more observational or more realistic methods, I just don't know how it's possible for some very simple paradigms maybe, but when you start getting in these sort of more complicated things, um, it's very difficult, which isn't to say that you shouldn't try to collect some of this data as well. I think if, like ethnographically maybe is a better way to think about it. So looking at what, whether or not this is reflecting in, your real, in the real world, but the actual kind of systematic data we can collect is not really possible. Um, okay, so I just wanted to put this in as an aside. So this is something that Ben Perzicki uh, has introduced to me and has kind of forced along a lot of us and we realize is a really good way to collect data. So um, this has nothing to do with vignettes, I just like it. So you know, we have a vi vignette about Mikhail being uh, uncooperative and losing his farm in a flood. Um, and then we, one of the questions that, well, the first thing we ask is what might have caused him to lose his farm in a flood? And we let people answer up to five things. They can answer as many or as few as they want. Uh, and we, we then code those answers um, and that's, that's a, a huge pain in the ass. It is incredibly time consuming, but it's a really nice kind of mid ground between qualitative and quantitative data. So we code these things, we can do things like quantitative analyses, looking at how many supernatural beliefs or how frequently people use supernatural beliefs in these um, when they list things. Um, it allows people to give multiple answers and a lot of people will. So when we talk about, when you talk about like, well, do super, do people really um, like, when you believe that God can punish you, would you consistently think that's true? The answer, I think, from this is clearly no. It's like one of the many options <laughs> that people will often say. I don't, uh, but you know, we do. We do kind of. We can look at the rates at which people answer this stuff, and we get really interesting 
kind of robust data that we then have to deal with. The other benefit I think of doing some of this stuff is it makes you actually really think about what you mean when you say supernatural beliefs. So if you're developing a coding scheme, you need to then define supernatural beliefs. So in this case, we do this, and I've used this, this a lot when doing coding type works. We look at causal relationships, and so we define it based on whether or not something could be plausibly based on what we know about sort of how children and humans think about you know, gravity and, and cause and effect and these sorts of things in, in sort of a naturalistic context, which isn't necessarily the same as the scientific understanding of these things. Is this plausible or not? So when we code supernatural beliefs, we do code things that are like karma or God caused it, but we also code, you know, like he's, you know, he harmed his brother, therefore, like he deserved this, this flood to come take his house and that's why it happened, right? That is in some sense a supernatural belief. So we're looking at this sort of, you've made something that can't plausibly, you're saying like he deserved to be punished so then he was punished for this and there's no kind of plausible causal pathway. So we would also code that as a supernatural, um, supernatural like belief. Um, so, so that's kind of how we end up doing this. And yeah, okay. Um, so, so um, again, I've done a lot of this stuff cross-culturally, and you know we have a lot of problems with questionnaires, but it, it's not to say that these vignettes aren't also problematic when you take them places. So one of the things that we found is a lot of people will just say, like, I'm not making a judgment of this person. I don't know enough about them. I can't, I can't make, I can't say if they're a good or bad person. You've given me one thing they did once, <laughs> and it's like, okay, but what do you maybe? So you know, it, it isn't, it isn't the case that these are always well received, but I think they, they're a little bit better than questionnaires still. Um, when you start, so, you know, when John and I sit down and think of all the things we would like to measure in a study like this, we end up with insane studies <laughs> we then have to cut down. Um, usually we have done this, but the one, the witchcraft one that I showed you uh, had nine conditions in it. So this was, this was not done with John, this was done with uh, Dimitri Sigalatis. Um, so it was, we had neutral, uh, religious ritual, magic ritual, and then we had neutral emo neutral motivation, uh, envy motivation, and selfishness motivation, which when you iterate is nine conditions, and when you show only one of those things to each person, you need a like 500 person sample, which we did manage to collect, but it was a lot of work, right? <laughs> so I think th those, you know, you kind of have to really think about what's important and whether or not it's, it's easy to get overly enthusiastic, at least if you're me. Um, and like there, so related to this, if you go the multiple vignette route, there's still a fairly strong limit on what you can do. People do not like doing a bunch of these, um, particularly if you go, if you're starting to look at places like the Hadza, they just won't answer them, they just leave. Um, and even if you do it with sort of students in, you know, Vancouver, they will finish the study, but are they paying attention? No. <laughs> So you can look at order effects of this, and it's pretty, it's pretty clear that people start answering more randomly if, they, um, if you give them more than a couple or three or four vignettes. Um, so, and then uh, if you make these giant unwieldy studies, it means you just need massive samples to do this. Okay. Um, so, sorry, there's a spelling error there. So one of the other things, so we've, we've tried lots of different ways to um, deal with this, and one of them is to have more varied vignettes so we can kind of look at more things, but, um, I mentioned this before, so we did this with the, the supernatural beliefs thing, so we had, we had a lot of different stories, people could read multiple sets of these vignettes, um, and we found that in one vignette specifically, which happened to be good behavior vignette, <laughs> so didn't even like bias it in our favor, um, over 50% of the people said it was witchcraft, right? And this was not common across any of the other things, and it's specifically because we changed the outcomes across vignettes, and this one was losing your voice, and this is just something that they think is caused by witchcraft. So um, again, we had enough data that it didn't like cause problems. We have this one sort of outlier when you look at the data. It's like what happened there, hmm. um, and it's just and it was just something that we wouldn't have anticipated because yeah, people seem to believe the Hadza don't have supernatural beliefs, but they clearly do. Okay, um, that's it. Uh, I I like to end my talks with a slide like this because I just think it's important. 
to recognize that we, there is very little of this domain we've actually explored. So when we talk about things like supernatural beliefs and, and how we measure them, you know, we're very focused on a very narrow set of things still, and there's this whole ocean of stuff we haven't even considered. So you know, we've, we've tried to do some stuff with kind of more varied looking at witchcraft beliefs and, and how this affects different types of behavior or looking at how karma and ancestor beliefs kind of interact. Um, but we still, the field is really focused on Christianity and Christian type beliefs, and I think that that's really narrowed what we think supernatural beliefs are, what we think the, the outcomes of supernatural beliefs are, like what we think the consequences to behavior are, um, and I think it's, it's important to kind of think about what the, what the space is that we haven't actually explored. Okay, that's it. I should say that we did not obligate any of the speakers to talk about work that they did with me. <laughs> <laughs> I just happen to have done a bunch of stuff. Like coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, I do really like Vinya, so let me just put that up there uh, first. I, I guess one of my concerns is that often respondents are kind of filling in the story mentally in a way that you didn't particularly like or want, and I think you alluded to that. So, um, you know, with the example, and this had to do with identity or in-group preference rather than a belief, uh, you had the devout Buddhist who was the restaurant inspector and did he or didn't he let off the violator. And, and you do say in the vignette, because he was a Buddhist or despite the fact that he was a Buddhist. But still, I wonder if you wouldn't have people who are kind of soft-hearted and would think, well, of course the restaurant owner deserved a second chance. You know, I, th that would have been the right thing to do. And then it becomes kind of irrelevant whether he was a Buddhist or not. Yeah, so I think that's absolutely true and that absolutely happens. So um, the one side of that, I think collecting qualitative data with it really helps with that. So it's really much easier to tell when you've messed up. <laughs> um, and that's really helpful. But the other thing is I think like when you do these things, part of using larger samples is that unless that's systematic, it just comes out as noise. So as long as it's not, as long as we can, we're confident that a, a lot or most people are doing this um, and that it's then that kind of that response shouldn't if, if someone has seen four vignettes that are four different stories and they have different sorts of in-group out-group bias they, they presumably would answer all of them uh, in favor of like giving being more lax uh, so it just comes out in the model as noise provided you have a long, large sample I think with any of these methods you know as soon as you get into the quantitative methods or specifically that caused more people to think, well, he deserved a separate chance, that, an, another chance that wasn't the thing we were measuring, <laughs> then that's a problem. But as long as someone's just more, like if they're consistently being more generous to people, then we should be okay, I hope. <laughs> uh, so I think I have two questions. But uh, So my first one is, uh, so you, you know when you hang around like anthropology types or cross-cultural psychology types, you hear like two attitudes expressed, right? So one. versus like hypothetical situations that you see in the yes and vice versa? I mean, I think people who are experts in those cultures know when you have to ask them. I don't know if there's any systematic way to look at it. Um, I think, you know, the, the major systematic prediction is like formal Western education. So if societies have highly 
formalized. People just are more used to dealing with hypotheticals because we've trained them to do this, right? right? So like, you know, it becomes something that they're a little bit more familiar with, but as soon as you start going out, but I mean, there's bigger problems than that. So like one of the problems that we have with the Hadza is that like, they don't really have a number theory. So asking them on a one to seven scale is just not. So like there's ways around it and you can kind of, and we end up doing like, um, no, don't know, yes, and they just kind of, they can answer those questions and then I have to scale it to like fit with the, you can run all your models without the Hadza and with the Hadza and it's like, it's it's a whole thing, but you know, you have to, if you want cross-cultural data, I think you have to deal with those things. The, the hypotheticals, I mean, I think the Roma population was the most, um, like we, we have a bunch of data that I just don't know if we can do anything with because it's so, uh, it's hard to interpret. <laughs> so, and it is this thing, like people just didn't answer questions and they didn't really, you know, and it, and it is that, like they don't like the, the, hypotheticals. the hypotheticals. And so- But in those it, cases, yeah. would they have preferred just like straightforward, like here's a sentence, do you agree with it? Like, or, or, um, or they, so we or did, I can't remember, I can't remember what we, so we had, we had economic games and we had scales oh. and we had some other measures and it was just universally pretty much, like I think you would, the, the way to deal with that is one, um, spent a lot more time than, so we had, I wasn't, I was kind of designing this project and other people uh -huh. were running it, but I think there was, um, I think there, there probably is a way to get at these answers in that population, but part of it is about who you are and if they trust you, and sure. that's really hard to, to gain that trust, and even if you're familiar and work with that population, I think it's very difficult to kind of, so yeah, there, there's lots of things to consider, and I think there, for any of these populations, there probably are ways to ask these questions, it's just a matter of figuring it out, and I don't know if we have a good systematic right, right, yeah. way of dealing just with that. Just to rely on informants yeah. in any yeah. given situation. I'm not going to ask my second question, uh, unless no one else has a question. I think this just follows on from what you're saying. Um, do you worry about the demand characteristics of the of using the vignettes? That they, what they're thinking is, well, what are the researchers trying to get at here? Um, yes, I do all the time. Um, so I, I think, like the 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 kind of whether or not this is a supernatural cause one was the one that we worried, and we really tried to make things so that they were like just impossible to be related <laughs> because we were quite worried about that. I'm not sure how, how well that worked. Um, I think we, we have ways of kind of ruling it out and looking at the, the sort of answers that people are, are giving and the fact that actually predominantly people don't give supernatural answers and they don't think that this is sort of helped with that somewhat. Um, I think the, the more you can make the kind of context less apparent, <laughs> the better it is, but that's not always. Like, it's a sort of a tough, you know, it's a juggling act between making this something simple that people can understand and making it harder to, to know what um, they're doing. So I think one of the ones that we, that was kind of our most successful version of this was going to, was the Singapore set that we used. And part of this is because you have a single cultural context, which is Chinese people in Singapore that have a bunch of different belief systems. And some of those belief systems overlap. So if we get people to kind of talk a whole bunch about ancestor worship beliefs, versus their Buddhist beliefs. So these are the same sort of groups of people, there was between subjects, but they're, this, they're all Buddhists. Right? So we can, we can get them to sort of say different things are normative based on whether or not they're thinking about like, well, my family. I mean, we could have done it with the same people because often yeah, yeah. the same individuals who are Christians but believe in karma. Yeah, right, so like you, you, get, you, you get those sorts <coughs> of things. I think like that, that helps me think that maybe <laughs> some of these are valid, but I think it's, it's a case by case basis and it's hard to, um, I, I think the other thing that when we talk about, so one of the things that I, I think about religious, when we're studying religious context is um, maybe not in the supernatural cause thing, but a lot of it demand characteristics is the thing we want, like we're kind of measuring it, we want to know, like if, you, if you're thinking about your religious beliefs, do you think you're supposed to act in this way? <laughs> like, so, so it is literally a demand characteristic, we are kind of asking them, um, like, okay, Think about your religious beliefs and now tell me, is this right or wrong? <laughs> and we, you know, whether or not they would actually behave in that way in a, is a different question, but we're looking at the norm and how these are shaping the norms. So essentially demand characteristics are what's interesting. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, again, case by case. Thanks for your talk. Um, so I have never used vignettes, I think, yet I, to think about how to improve them and how to improve some of the issues you talked about. Um, and I would just like to know your opinion about the, these suggestions. So 
about uh, I'm thinking a lot about the realism or of the issue of the vignettes and how well they can simulate real life. And I'm thinking, have you ever considered actually using something like a computer game, you know, where you could, or you can also think about virtual reality, where you could put people actually into these situations, rather than imagine them through vignettes, and how this could um, increase, you know, the validity of these vignettes. That's like one suggestion, which that there's obvious limitation, it's extremely expensive, and you know, you are gonna limit your targeted populations just to people who can use these these mm -hmm. uh, expensive machines. But the, the other suggestion, you know, which is kind of like going broader, but um, less detailed, would be something like citizen science. And, you know, like designing simple games that you can just then distribute, you know, across the world, like something like the moral machine, uh, you know, with self-driving cars, something like that. So whether, like, my question is, do you think these are feasible uh, alternatives for the future where we can try to uh, push these, these uh, methods forward, or is this a blind way? I am willing to try anything that wouldn't help, I think. <laughs> so, I mean, I think the citizen science stuff is always really interesting. It takes a lot of money to run mm. those projects. Mm. So the first step is finding someone who will give you enough money to set up and maintain the sort of citizen science websites, and that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. <laughs> um, so I, I think, yeah, that that's, you, you know, designing games, things like that. The, the, I mean, the, the two reasons we haven't done this, because we have actually, games specifically, VR I, I haven't really considered, although I think it would be uh, helpful. Um, so uh, I, can't program a game, so I need to pay someone to do that. And I like there's there's a kind of a set of so yes, this is very doable, um, but you you want to write a grant? I'm into it. <laughs> uh, but I think so. But the the second point that, that you made is that it does really limit who can actually do this because it isn't the case that like the 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 vignette stories. I mean, in a lot of places where we have done this, you read them to people. Um, so even in Mauritius, we'll read them to people, um, and that's you know. That's just a very accessible way to interact with people all over the world. You can kind of do sort of more diverse samples. You can sample people who are illiterate and people who are literate in the same society. You can look at all of these things, whereas I think once you start getting into the more technological solutions, it becomes harder and harder. Yeah. But the other problem, presumably, is that you can't, like, I don't know, it can't maybe be too strong, but like, but you know, a lot of vignettes we've run together, like, explicitly assert what the mental states of the mm. agents in the stories are. You, you know, like, unless you have thought bubbles in a VR situation, yeah. you know, like, yeah. you, you can't really, right, then, then you're expecting the people to make inferences about the mental states, mm. but, but then, then there's less control, right? So I think there's some vignettes that involve asserting what the mental states are of the characters that are, are just that much more difficult to do in a sort of VR or, or even game context, I think. But we've done stuff like we've, we've included pictures, we've done cartoons with various things, so that, that makes it a little bit more, like, um, I don't know, maybe realistic, <laughs> or like a little bit, there's a little bit more going on than just a verbal story, but um, I think there are lots of ways, you know, the more realistic the better, but there's limitations to all of this stuff. So, so very to follow up, I, I totally agree, and, and you know, during my career, I often found that just pen and paper, yeah. it's, it's like either highly correlated, or it's the same level of quality, <laughs> it's just, and super cheap, so, you know, I'm just not saying, you know, you should go for yeah. I think, but you know, maybe we should just at least try and see whether. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if, if yeah, I'm into it, I would happily do it. <laughs> we actually we have a we have a VR headset now in our in our um, research center because we were trying to get like a bunch of like a printer and tablets we put into this project fund, and they basically told us our equipment wasn't expensive enough to, to so we like, we now have a VR headset because we needed to spend like three grand more to like fit into this fund. So yeah, maybe maybe we'll start doing VR. Uh, someone has to use that or we're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Is that, am I done? All right, well, it's uh, now, Three o'clock, so we probably should break up for a coffee break in half an hour.